It is therefore now time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. Good morning, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Minister of Energy. The People's Guarantee lays out Patrick Brown and the PC's uh, plan for hydro in Ontario. Under Premier Wynne and the Liberals, we know that hydro rates have tripled. In fact, families are paying on average $1,000 more a year than when the Liberal government was first elected back in 2003. The People's Guarantee is a plan to get hydro back on track. It provides an additional 12% off hydro bills. That means the average household will save $173 per year on their hydro bill under Patrick Brown and the Ontario PCs. So, Mr. Speaker, isn't that a plan that even the Liberals can get behind? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, becoming quite clear that you know the, the 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 PCs and their leader can't be trusted. They've now decided to say anything to anybody to make sure that they can get elected. Months months after nine, after trying to deny, Mr. Speaker, that our 25 percent reduction on bills for families and as many as half a million uh, small businesses and farms by voting against our fair hydro plan, they're now sneakily, Mr. Speaker, including it in their own platform. Um, worse than that claim about reducing further rates is reckless and only opens up an even larger hole, Mr. Speaker, in their already gaping fiscal plan. I believe the proof is in the fine print at the back of their platform. Over $12 billion, Mr. Speaker, in cuts. This includes over $6 billion of across-the-board unspecified cuts. And shifting, of course, Mr. Speaker, conservation yes, programs sir. from costs from taxpayers. Um, Again, making sure their fiscal hole continues to grow, Mr. Speaker. We've act Speaker, more liberal spin. They're just hoping that something actually sticks, but it's not. Just look at what our leader said this morning. He wanted you to consider this. Premier Wynne and the Liberals accepted. $1.3 million in donations from companies who receive the biggest contracts for energy that we don't need any longer in Ontario. That meant these insider contracts resulted in families overpaying on their electricity bills by $9.2 billion. That's the biggest reason why our electricity bills are skyrocketing. Then, to make matters worse, the Wynn Liberals sold off Hydro One. It was a fire sale to reward her donors, insiders, and fat cat friends. That's why this government can't be trusted after 14 long years. So, Mr. Speaker, I do wonder, when did the Liberals decide that they were going to be for the insiders and not for the people who are paying the hydro bills? It makes, it makes you wonder, Mr. Speaker, actually, who is defending families, and on this side of the House that is actually defending families, Mr. Speaker. We brought forward a 25 percent reduction that all families are seeing, but it begs the question, Mr. Speaker, because under their plan, costs are going to rise. Let's look at their, at their, their carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. The truth is that under their carbon tax scheme, you'll pay more and get less. Independent expert analysis from the C.D. Howe Institute, for example, confirms this, Mr. Speaker, showing their carbon tax would add $1,200 in annual costs for families. And this is more than any of the tax cuts that the Conservatives claims to be offering as well, Mr. Speaker. The National Post has called it a shell game, noting that any tax cut will be paid for by an 81 per cent increase in the existing provincial tax on gasoline, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to energy, it is this government that has brought forward serious reductions for families from right across this province, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I can understand why the minister would rather talk about cap and trade than talk about hydro, because their record over the last 13 years is repugnant when it comes to the hydro plan. Our electricity plan, our hydro plan, unlike the Liberals, isn't a risky borrowing scheme. We're not going to spend billions of dollars in interest just to get through the next election, Mr. Speaker. Our plan, the People's Guarantee, offers real, lasting relief for the people of Ontario on their hydro bills. 12 per cent more off hydro bills is the People's Guarantee. We think families in Ontario deserve that after paying the fastest rising rates in North America thanks to this government. Mr. Speaker, don't the Liberals realize Ontario deserves long-lasting hydro relief? Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that that party is guaranteeing is that everything is going to go up in Ontario. That's their guarantee, Mr. Speaker. They're actually even talking about our fair hydro plan, the 25 percent that we actually brought forward, and they voted against, Mr. Speaker. They talk about it all the time, but they have nothing, Mr. Speaker, that is actually going to do anything that will actually help the families that the way we have done on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. And given the gap that we know that is in their plan, Mr. Speaker, we know that across the board cuts are coming, just like the Harris years, putting both existing and future programs at risk. We already know investments like the $300 million in uh, home and school retrofits, the $575 million in social housing uh, repairs will be scrapped once the Conservatives drop cap and trade and create a more expensive uh, carbon tax. But what else, Answer. Mr. Speaker? Are they going to cancel the OESP program? Are they going to cancel the First Nation delivery credit? Are they going to make sure that they eliminate the $100 million dollar affordability fund. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, all they know how to do is cut. All sides, both sides, all three parties have indicated that they themselves cannot control themselves. I'll get it. We're in warnings. We're in warnings. New question. Member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, we'll try this again with the Minister of Energy today. The People's Guarantee lays out an additional 12 per cent off families' hydro bills. But it doesn't stop there, Speaker. It'll rein in ridiculous executive salaries like the ones at Hydro One. We know the Liberals won't, because they're the ones who signed the contracts in the first place for $4.5 million for the CEO at Hydro One. Shameful. Mr. Speaker, the PCs will rein in the $4.5 million salaries that the Liberals are doling out. Will the Liberals keep handing out millions in salaries that Ontarians can't afford? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government will continue to act on behalf of the people of Ontario and keep electricity affordable as possible, as clean as possible, and rely as reliable as possible, Mr. Speaker. Unlike the opposition that has a plan to rip up contracts, Mr. Speaker, rip up contracts that are signed. You know what, Mr. Speaker? At the end of the day, that really makes this province a banana republic. So it actually makes you think about what they've done, Mr. Speaker, when they're putting it. The member from Timmins, James Bay, is warned. The member from Oxford is warned. Finish. So, Mr. Speaker, again, it begs the question, what are they going to continue to cut? I've talked about the you know, $575 million for social housing repairs. Are they going to cut the Ontario Electricity Support Program? Are they going to cut the Triple RP, which helps thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, Mr. Speaker, right across our province, especially in rural and northern parts Thank of you. the province? Yeah, hey. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the members of the Liberal government keep fabricating these tales. They're just not believable. Not acceptable. Re withdraw. 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 Carry on. Mr. Speaker, they're making it up as they go along. It's a word that starts with L and ends with S. They cannot continue to do this. They can't continue. The member will withdraw, and if he does it again, I'll warn him. Thank you, sir. I was, thank you. Withdraw. Withdraw. Referring to Liberals, Mr. Speaker, four and a half million dollar salaries. I'm not. I'm not accepting the challenge to the chair when I make a ruling. It will not happen again, or I'll name you. Carry on. Thank you, Speaker. Four and a half million dollar salaries are the legacy of this Liberal government in Ontario. They're the reason, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons Question. why Ontario has astronomical hydro prices. Speaker, yeah. do the Liberals not think Ontario needs long-lasting relief on their hydro bills instead of their cynical borrowing scheme? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A 25 percent reduction is something that we've seen in this province, Mr. Speaker, over the last few months that they voted against, Mr. Speaker. When you're wanting to talk about how we're helping families, this is significant savings for families. But it also begs the question as to how they're going to explain the $12 billion in cuts, or what about the $1,200 that families will see in annual costs thanks to their carbon tax scheme, Mr. Speaker? And that is more. That is absolutely more than any tax cut that they're proposing, Mr. Speaker, or even to be offering. Unlike 
our cap and trade on, on greenhouse gas pollution from business, their carbon tax would even not ensure that emissions would be reduced either, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, the Conservatives are also hiding the fact that yes, you've cut over $6 billion in green projects that help fight climate change. And the important th thing about uh, energy and environment, Mr. Speaker, is these two work Thank hand you. in hand. Yes, Final supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. And again, I'm talking about electricity prices in Ontario, and the minister just doesn't understand or he wants to talk about something else. But if he wants to talk about cap and trade, we will keep hundreds of millions of dollars from leaving Ontario for Hollywood, California, and Quebec City, Quebec, keeping that money here in Ontario to provide tax relief in this province instead of sending money elsewhere. You know, the government's own internal documents and the Auditor General have confirmed that if the Wynn Liberals are re-elected, Ontario's electricity rates are going to skyrocket to the highest that they've ever been. They can't be trusted, Speaker. That's why the People's Guarantee is a plan for long-lasting hydro relief here in Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, the question is simple this morning. Why doesn't the government support real long-lasting relief for Ontario electricity customers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Long-lasting relief was brought to the people of Ontario, and they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. Their record shows that they could care less about making sure that the people of Ontario actually get a break and actually worry about making sure that they can put a glossy magazine that people will recycle as quickly as they will when they read it, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that we're helping families with a 25 percent reduction. We're making sure we're helping our First Nations individuals. We're making sure that we've helped our individuals who live in um, northern or rural parts of our province, Mr. Speaker. We know that the fine print in the back of their document talks about $12 billion in cuts. This includes over $6 billion of across-the-board unspecified cuts. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? Thousands of teachers being fired? Um, you know, thousands of registered nurses without a job. That's what their legacy is, Answer. Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, our legacy is building this province up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday I asked the Acting Premier why the privatized Hydro One is trying to skirt the ban on wintertime hydro disconnections with their proposal to have families install prepay meters. The minister responded by saying that that isn't Hydro One's intention, but families and businesses struggling to keep up with their soaring hydro bills can't afford for Hydro One to have a change of heart. They need a guarantee that prepay meters will not be coming to Ontario. Will the acting premier commit today to giving people the peace of mind that they deserve and ban the use of prepay meters, uh, hydro meters, in the province of Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't know much uh, much more clear um, I can be. Maybe the members of the third party need to take their Ill illogical earplugs out, Mr. Speaker, because last week, the member of Toronto, Dan Forth, and the VP of Customer Care at Hydro One both participated in an interview on the radio. In that interview, Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, was very clear when they said none of this will be forced onto any customer. If, in fact, we are to proceed with this technology like this, we will still need to develop and test. member from Niagara Falls is warned. Finished. It will be at the customer's discretion. So I'll remind the third party one more time. Any technology that electricity utility companies introduce must abide by the winter disconnection laws. And additionally, yes, it was Hydro One who was the first to voluntarily end winter disconnections with their winter relief program, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, the clarity that people of Ontario need is a full-out ban on prepaid hydro meters. That's the clarity that they deserve. The minister also said yesterday that the OEB has turned down proposals like this before because the OEB is in the business of protecting ratepayers. I'd like to remind this Liberal government and the minister in particular that looking out for ratepayers is actually the responsibility of this government. I'm sorry. Please finish. I'd like 
to remind this government, this Liberal government, and the minister in particular, that looking out for ratepayers is actually the responsibility, the job of the government, not the OEB. So when will the government Question. do its job and stand up for the people of Ontario and put a complete ban on the implementation of prepaid hydrometers okay. in the province of Ontario? You say that, please. You say that, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it's this government that stands up and brings forward an affordability plan through the Fair Hydro plan to actually help ratepayers, and that party votes against it, Mr. Speaker. We bring forward a plan that actually helps First Nations individuals living on reserve by eliminating their delivery charge. It's that party that votes against it. We bring forward a plan that increases the Ontario Electricity Support Program that helps low-income individuals. It's that party that votes against it, Mr. Speaker. The OEB has a mandate to make sure that they protect ratepayers, and it's this government, Mr. Speaker, that has done that. Besides the fact that they vote against everything we do to actually protect ratepayers, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the end of the day, what the OEB is doing is reviewing the application. There is no prepaid meter coming to Ontario, Mr. Speaker. It is actually not even being considered right now. It is being That's reviewed. True. At the end of the day, Hydro One has said this would be an opt-in program if if, Mr. Speaker, this was to happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, this Liberal government seems quite comfortable leaving the fate of Ontario families and businesses up to the private for-profit Hydro One. But this company has already shown very clearly that it does not have the best interests of Ontarians at heart. It's applied for numerous rate increases. It's invested in a dirty, coal-burning American energy company instead of our own power grid. And now it desperately wants to get around a ban on wintertime hydro disconnections. When will this Liberal government admit that the privatization experiment has failed? Stand up for Ontario families and businesses and begin to undo the damage of decades of Conservative and Liberal sell-offs and the damage that they have done with those sell-offs by bringing Hydro One back into Question. public hands. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, the law states that there can be no winter disconnections, and this um, proposed idea in the application brought forward by Hydro One wouldn't be able to circumvent that, Mr. Speaker. That would not be able to happen. That was said by Hydro One on a radio interview that the member from um, uh, Toronto Danforth was participating in, Mr. Speaker. They know, LDCs know, that they can't circumvent the law, Mr. Speaker. When looking at the prepaid program, this is being reviewed right now by the OEB. If and when the OEB makes a decision, and they have a history, Mr. Speaker, of actually defending the ratepayer, making sure that they reduce applications significantly brought forward by any LDC, that they have the ratepayer's interest at heart, this would be an opt in program. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My next uh, question is also for the Acting Premier. The Liberals and Conservatives like to privatize things. They did it with electricity, and now they're doing it with health care. Thanks to both of these parties, there are over 1,000 for-profit private clinics operating in Ontario today. And now the Premier's health care privatization bill will open the door even wider for private health care in Ontario when we already know, just by looking to our neighbours in the South, that privatized health care doesn't work for the vast majority of people. The NDP has an amendment to this omnibus bill that will ensure that any new health care facilities that open as a result of these changes will be not-for-profit. If the Acting Premier and this Liberal government are serious about making sure there is no more private health care in Ontario, they should commit to passing the NDP amendment in committee. Will the acting premier Question. commit to doing that right now? For health, long-term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the legislation that actually we're going through clause by clause in committee uh, right now uh, this week uh, that provides a, a number of accountability measures, enhancing the oversight, the supervision, 
the transparency and the accountability of uh, many of those uh, health activities that take place outside of our hospitals, Mr. Speaker, and private hospitals are one category of that because way back in 1931, there was an act created called the Private Hospitals Act. Uh, the intent through this legislation is to repeal that act, to end it, to delete it yeah. and get rid of it. And we currently have, long before any Liberal government, we currently have a, a six grandfathered private hospitals that uh, reside within that act. And so th this legislation, as we go forward, is going to transition those existing grandfathered yes, private hospitals into a better regime of oversight and accountability and transparency. I think we can also appreciate, we all can appreciate the value of Thank that. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontarians don't believe that a person's health should depend on how much money they have. Dr. Doris Grinspan, CEO of the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, says, and I quote, we are very concerned with Schedule 9, which will effectively lift the ban on the creation of private hospitals in Ontario. Thus, we oppose the repeal of the Private Hospitals Act and the Independent Health Facilities Act and ask for the complete withdrawal of Schedule 9." End quote. The NDP has another bill, uh, amendment to Bill 160, Speaker, that would do exactly this. Remove Schedule 9 from the bill entirely to ensure that no private for-profit hospitals open in Ontario. Is this Liberal government planning to act on their own rhetoric, Speaker, and vote for the NDP uh, motion or amendment rather in committee so that Ontario families Question. can actually rest assured that they will never ever have to pay out of pocket for hospital services. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, so we're absolutely committed as a Liberal government to end the presence of private hospitals in this province. There are six grandfathered. We're transitioning. I don't know if the leader of the third party is suggesting by deleting Schedule 9, those hospitals will not have a regulatory or oversight accountability regime that applies to them. What this legislation in Schedule 9 does is addresses those existing gaps in oversight. It strengthens enforcement and accountability. I can't imagine that the leader of the third party is suggesting that we leave those uh, entities without oversight, without accountability, without transparency to Ontarians. So, Mr. Speaker, this is such important legislation that in addition to the the fact that we have effectively had a ban on the creation of any new private hospitals in this province for a long time, Mr. Answer. Speaker. We're getting rid of an almost 100-year piece of legislation and increasing accountability. Thank you. Final supplementary. It's shocking, Speaker, that the Minister of Health is basically saying that the um, CEO of Registered Nurses Association of Ontario is wrong. I'm shocked. I'm surprised. They usually are quite uh, uh, well informed. Elizabeth Ballerman of the National Union of Public and General Employees says this of the Liberal health care privatization omnibus bill, quote, adding a for-profit angle to health care in Ontario is not only wrong, it is dangerous. Privatization of our health care system leaves Ontario Ontarians vulnerable to a number of risks, not only to their own health, but to their overall well-being. Dangerous is how experts are describing this latest Liberal privatization scheme. Has the Liberal government learned nothing from the disastrous Hydro One sell-off, or will the acting Premier push ahead with health care privatization and force Ontario families to pay Question. the price? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're doing the opposite of what the leader of the third party is suggesting. We're actually ending private hospitals. And I have to give credit to the Ontario Health Coalition, Mr. Speaker. We've been working closely, uh, including with their legal team, over the past week to make sure we could be absolutely crystal clear and that any future governments would not have the ability to create private hospitals unless they were to come back into this legislation and amend the legislation. We want to rid this province of private hospitals, but acknowledge that there are six that were grandfathered that are providing, uh, 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 providing services to Ontario. We need to, however, move them into a regime of full accountability, transparency and oversight by the Ministry of Health. And I think if the member opposite were to speak with the Ontario Health Coalition and were to speak with RNAO, particularly once this legislation is passed, yes, they will be satisfied that our intent is equal to theirs. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds, Brendan. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the uh, government house leader. 
The level of the government's debate over the last few days has been appalling mm -hmm. and probably embarrassing for them. They've re been reduced to being talking point robots, spoon-fed by the nonsense from their Liberal Research Bureau. You can't trust a word they say. Nothing that comes out of their mouths has any credibility. So I want you to look at the history. The Ottawa Citizen wrote, the Liberals are declaring themselves the champion of facts, but in reality, the Ontario Liberals are making things worse yep. as, they, as we get dubious political spin dressed up as fact-checking. We all remember the Bob Probert incident when the Minister of Energy had to issue an apology to Troy Crowder because the Liberal Research Services couldn't even fact-check a hockey fight. That's the kind of team that's feeding yep. this government the utter nonsense yep. and malarkey that yes. we're hearing from. Yep. So, Speaker, my Thank question, you. as the leader of the government in this House. Thank you. Government House Leader. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, for the question from the House, uh, from the from the uh, member opposite. Because I think, Speaker, when we sp speak about the deep hidden cuts in their glossy magazine platform, that is talking about facts. Speaker, when we talk about the fact that right there on page 76 of their glossy magazine, there are 12 billion dollar worth of cuts, and wow. asking the opposition, asking the Conservatives and, the, and Patrick Brown to explain to Ontarians what services, what programs are going to, they're going to cut is not uh, a speaker wasting time. I think Ontarians deserve to know what, Ontario, what services, what programs the PC Sir. party and Patrick Brown are going to cut because speaker on this side of the house, we're committed to keep All right, a reminder to the member and all members that you refer to anybody, either by their title or by their writing, and I hope it stays that way. Supplementary. Yeah, the Speaker, back to the government house leader, who's acquiesced to uh, liberal research services that can't fact-check out of a wet paper bag. I'm going to give him some more highlights. The Toronto Star wrote, Liberals mocked over frivolous complaint that Tories NDP are breaking fundraising law. Let's not forget about the time the Liberal Research Bureau got the two downtown Toronto venues mixed up. The Ottawa Citizen wrote about saying crying sexism without having done their research reveals something about them. Yep. The Deep Sun down. summarized it as by asking, is there a twit club? And then there was a TVO reporter who, who I can't even say what he said because it's an unparliamentary language. So, again, back to the government house leader. Are you going to take back control from the Liberal researchers? Are you going to take back and bring facts back to this government's house? Or are you going to continue to lower the debate in this house? Can you say it, please? Can you say it, please? Thank you. Well, Speaker, $12 billion dollars worth of deep cuts is what Patrick Brown and the Conservatives. Sorry. The member will correct. $12 billion dollars worth of deep cuts is what the Conservatives and their leader is guaranteeing to the people of Ontario, Speaker, and that is not acceptable to us. Speaker, their plan. Under their plan, Ontarians will pay more and will get less. They are going to cut $6 billion worth of programs that will ensure that our hospitals are more energy efficient, that our schools are more energy efficient and are good places for our children to study. They will cut all environmental programming so that we can really tackle with the issue of climate change. In fact, Speaker, they are going to bring a carbon tax that is going to cost people more money. Speaker, that's not the kind of people's guarantee we need from the opposition. They need to explain to Ontarians what are their $12 billion. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. Yesterday, Chief Fobister and members of Grassy Narrows First Nation travelled here with a simple request. Will this Liberal government build a mercury poisoning treatment centre in Grassy Narrows so that the sick and dying can get care without being separated from their loved ones? 
Deputy Minister. Deputy Minister of uh, Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation. Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation. Well, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, speaker, I can uh, uh, tell you today that uh, this morning there was a very productive and effective uh, meeting with uh, Minister Philpott, with Chief Pache, with Chief Fobiser, with myself, and various advisors representing the chiefs, the federal government, and the province of Ontario. I'm quoting Minister Philpott at that meeting this morning. She said, we have turned a page on these issues, that is the mercury issues. Speaker, that was met by a round of applause at all of those at this morning's meeting. Our uh, technical staff is continuing with the meeting uh, as I speak, and I can tell you, Speaker, that uh, later today there will be further details uh, released. It was a very productive. The issue has been Answer. advanced in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. The people of Grassy Narrows can't wait any longer to have the mercury cleaned up from the English River system. They can't wait any longer for a mercury poisoning treatment centre in their community. Why not greenlight this project today, send a construction crew to Grassy Narrows this week, and just get the job done? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, as I've said, we had a very productive meeting uh, this morning on a host of issues. As I've said previously in this House, with regard to the, uh, uh, the cleanup of the English Wabagoon River system, we have provided $5.2 million to do the remediation workup. That's a study that will look into how the remediation should be done. In addition to that, Speaker, we have provided $85 million for actual work on the remediation after the remediation workup uh, has been done. Speaker, we are serious about dealing with these issues in the English Wabagoon River system. We recognize that uh, something has to be done and will be done on the cleanup. In addition to that, we had this meeting this morning on uh, other issues. Sir? There will be more details later today, but it was a good meeting. Thank you. The question, the member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough and Westdale. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and long-term care. Uh, speaker, we know that lung disease affects millions of Ontarians, not just the 2.4 million who live with a chronic respiratory illness, but also the millions more who deserve to breathe with ease. Our government has been taking action to promote lung health and prevent lung disease. Last year, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of our Smoke-Free Ontario strategy, which helps smokers quit protects people from exposure to secondhand smoke and works to protect the health of children and youth. As a result of these efforts, we have decreased the smoking rate from 20.9% in 2005 to 17.4%, about 480,000 West. <laughs> Speaker, can the minister please explain what Question. other steps our government is taking to improve lung health for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, Westdale for the question. And if I may, I'd like to take a moment first to recognize the tremendous work the member has done to advocate for better lung health in yes. Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we can all breathe easier because of the hard work done by the member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough, West, Westdale. And with the help of the Lung Association here in Ontario, he has been a crucial part of the establishment of the new Ontario Lung Health Consultation Group. This group will consist of health experts, persons with lived experience, caregivers, advocates, and more. And they'll provide my ministry with advice and recommendations on research, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of lung disease, and for the development of an Ontario Lung Health Action Plan. Through this collaboration, I'm Answer. confident that we'll be successful in protecting and caring for the millions of Ontarians who live with a lung disease. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, <clears throat> Minister, and uh, through you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to just take a minute to acknowledge uh, with uh, gratitude uh, the member from Cambridge who spearheaded this initiative. 
I know, Mr. Speaker, that this group will create a plan that will ensure we are providing a coordinated approach to prevent lung disease, improve patient outcomes, and reduce health care spending. Our government recognizes that those who live with the chronic <coughs> lung disease have real challenges, as well as their families rightfully deserve a plan that will ensure less people suffer the loss of a lung one to, to lung disease. And we're confident that this group will help to achieve just that working with our wonderful partners from the Ontario Lung Association. Uh, speaker, can the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please share with us what else this government is doing to promote uh, lung health in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you again to the member from Ancaster, Dundas, Flamborough and Westdale for that question. This summer, in partnership with Cancer Care Ontario, we launched a new screening pilot for people at risk of getting lung cancer. And the pilot ensures that we're doing our best to organize lung cancer screening for people at high risk across this province. And in fact, the pilot sites are based out of the Ottawa Hospital, the Renfrew Victoria Hospital, Health Sciences North in Sudbury, and Lake Ridge Health in Oshawa. We also have a number of existing programs that address COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, and other lung diseases. And of course, we'll also, starting January 1st through OHIP Plus, be providing free, absolutely free asthma inhalers, those puffers of steroids and Ventolin to children and youth through OHIP Plus, Mr. Speaker. I'm confident that with the members' continued advocacy uh, and the member from Cambridge uh, and our partnership with the Answer. Lung Association that we'll be able to achieve much, much more for the lung health of Ontarians. Thank you. New question, the member from the PN Carlton. My question is to the Finance Minister. Earlier this week, Ontario PC leader Patrick Brown announced an important plank in the People's Guarantee. He announced that an Ontario progressive conservative government will introduce a new Ontario child care refund for up to 75 per cent of child care expenses, or up to $6,750 per child. That is real change, real change that would make life affordable for Ontario families. Can the minister explain why he doesn't support much-needed relief for Ontario families? member from Etobicoke North is warned. You may finish. Some fun. Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. And of course, we all want relief for Ontario families, and the member opposite and, and her party are not doing that. In fact, all they have done, and it's quoted time and time again this week, about that their uh, plan doesn't add up, and that's coming from their own expert advisors. Uh, it, it's the fine print on, on their last page of their report make it clear that they have $12 billion in cuts. And the question remains, what are you going to cut? Which hospitals are you going to cut? I recall, Mr. Speaker, there was another five-point plan, Mike Harris. And where did that take you, Mr. Speaker? Well, let me see, Mr. Speaker. His five-point plan said he would not negatively impact classroom education. We know he created a crisis. He said he would not close down hospitals. Instead, he closed down dozens of hospitals, fired nurses, and brought the system to his knees. Mr. Speaker, Answer. what are you guys going to cut? Thank you. I got to do my job. I am going to stop the clock. I am going to uh, remind. It's delicate. I do want in the house everyone to be use their title or their writing, and I'm going to suggest that you indicate your leader and then his name, please. Carry on. We're going to cut an economic development minister who lost 330,000 manufacturing jobs. Wow. We're going to cut a minister of infrastructure who doesn't know how to roll out infrastructure. Hey, hey, hey. We're going to cut a minister of health who lets patients stay in hospital floors. We're going to cut a, a deputy premier who allowed the longest college strike in Ontario history. We're going to cut a finance minister who had to save his own seat by cancelling $1.2 billion in gas plants. We're going to cut a, a Treasury Board president that has to fight with the Auditor General all the time. We're going to cut a transportation minister who built an upside-down First, first, when I stand, you sit. Second, Minister of Agriculture is warned.
Thank you. Mr. Finance. Speaker, here's what I suspect they're going to cut because they voted against these very measures in the past. They're going to cut OSAP, free tuition for students. They're going to cut OHIP Plus, free pharma care for those under 25. They're going to cut $16 billion in infrastructure to schools this year alone, Mr. Speaker. $20 billion for hospitals, $190 billion over the next 13 years for roads and bridges. And, Mr. Speaker, the list goes on because they voted against these very measures. And furthermore, the National Post, another favorite of theirs, say that it's all a shell game for middle class income earners. They're going to have an 81 percent increase in gas taxes for the people of Ontario, costing them more money. And furthermore, they're going to go into deficit, Mr. Speaker. They can't even balance the books when they're making all of these cuts and all these revenue increases. It's fiscally ir irresponsible and a social yes, deficit sir. as much as the fiscal deficit that they're providing. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the acting premier. With Bill 166, this Liberal government told the public that they wanted to protect fans who bought tickets to concerts and sporting events. One of the ways this government can protect fans is by revealing how many tickets actually go on sale to the public and how many are just giveaways to VIPs or resold at higher prices. If venues publish this information, then consumers would know when they are being gouged. During the debate on Bill 166, the Attorney General said 99 per cent were in favour of at least some additional transparency requirements. Yet last week we found out the Liberals removed that section of the consumer protection from their own bill. Mr. Speaker, will the acting Premier tell Ontarians who pressured the Premier to abandon protecting consumers who just want to buy tickets to concerts Question. and sporting events? Thank you. Attorney General. Speaker. Attorney General. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I want to thank the member for asking uh, a very important question. As Speaker, as you know, uh, we have uh, uh, brought a piece of legislation that is uh, working through this House, which uh, really will ensure that we put uh, fans first when it comes to uh, tickets events, uh, sporting events, concerts, etc. We have heard very clearly from Ontarians that they uh, want to ensure uh, that they get uh, tickets at affordable price, that they have a, a fair shot at getting tickets. And that's why, Speaker, the proposal before this House uh, would uh, put a ban on these uh, computer bots, would in fact will ensure that uh, resellers uh, or pe consumers, uh, people will not be able to sell tickets that were bought by bots. But we, Speaker, we're also taking the financial incentive away from bots by making sure that we're putting a cap of 50 per cent on, on resale uh, prices yes, so that Ontarians do have access to affordable uh, tickets. There are very robust enforcement measures and transparency transparency requirements that I will speak to Thank in the supplementary. supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Acting Premier. We've heard numerous complaints that venues are holding back massive amount of tickets, which means only a small fraction ever go on sale at face value. That means when parents save enough money to take their kids to a Jays game, an Argo game, or a Leaf game, they only have a small opportunity to buy tickets at a fair price. Most times, they have to choose between paying highly inflated prices for tickets from scalpers or letting their kids down. This Liberal government says it's committed to transparency and protecting consumers who want to see shows or attend sporting events. Speaker, if that's the case, why are the Liberals backtracking on this important issue of consumer protection and letting down those people who just want to take their kids and their grandkids Question. to sporting events? Thank you. I'm, I'm really, uh, really happy to hear that the, the member opposite is interested in this issue that we have shown leadership in addressing. And transparency, Speaker, is uh, is a very big part of it. In fact, one of the one of the big things that we're doing in this legislation, Speaker, is is uh, we're ensuring that there's all-in pricing so that consumers, fans, know exactly what they what they're uh, what they're paying. Uh, for. Now, Speaker, we did also uh, talk to a lot of artists, and we wanted to make sure that there's no unintended consequences to this legislation, and the amendment that we have proposed exactly deals with that. We want to make sure that we have a robust arts and culture, uh, culture scene 
all across Ontario, just not in Toronto. And one of the concerns that was raised to us, which is legitimate, that uh, some of the requirements that was uh, initially proposed may uh, result in artists not coming to smaller regional markets like Niagara, the members riding, or Ottawa, Kingston, Windsor. We want yes, to sir. make sure, Speaker, that our arts and culture community is thriving in all parts of the province, and these big, big, these big acts uh, come to our smaller markets, Thank and you. our rules don't cause all a detriment. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, a member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. Our government has been running a $20 million pilot in 22 communities across the province to increase affordable housing options for survivors of domestic violence and their families. Speaker, the Portable Housing Benefit provides families with the freedom to choose where they live since the subsidy isn't tied to a specific unit like the most rent geared to income housing. The two-year pilot project for the portable housing benefit was launched in September 2016 in 22 regions throughout Ontario. Right. Speaker, the portable housing benefit has been an important program for helping survivors find stability and housing. Could the minister update the House on the announcement that he made yesterday? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member of Barry for the question and also for her advocacy on behalf of vulnerable Ontarians. We've been doing very important work to help survivors and their families escape violence by providing them with a flexible, portable housing benefit. That's why I was happy to announce yesterday that after a successful pilot, we're expanding the portable housing benefit right across Ontario. We will also be expanding the program to include victims of human trafficking. And I was also uh, happy to announce Great. that these survivors of human trafficking will also receive special priority access to social housing as victims of domestic violence do now. We're dedicated to making this program better, to provide easier access, make it more inclusive. This expanded benefit is providing $30 million over three years to support 3,000 survivors and will increase to $50 million a year in 2020. It's going to provide housing when and where. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Minister of Housing and the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. Earlier this year, the Ministry of Housing introduced its new Fair Housing Plan. This plan includes 16 comprehensive measures to help Ontarians find a safe, suitable and affordable place to call home. Plan. The plan is helping people find affordable homes, increase supply, protect buyers and renters and bring stability to the real estate market. I understand that the Minister made an announcement this morning about the Fair Housing Plan and how he is working to encourage the creation of new purpose-built rental in Ontario. Could the minister please update the House on this announcement? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was very pleased uh, to be able to announce uh, this morning a key part of our fair housing plan. In some places in this province, it's very hard to find suitable, affordable housing, and especially for those who want to rent. We're seeing condo buildings pop up on every corner, but not quite so many rental developments are being built. This morning, I was pleased to announce that Ontario is making it easier for people to find a place to call home by helping incentivize the construction of more rental housing in communities where many people rent, but rentals are hard to find. We will encourage developers to build new rental housing by rebating development charges, Mr. Wow. Speaker, and we'll continue, we'll continue to work uh, on ways to increase the supply of housing in Ontario, and this builds on the other initiatives in our fair housing plan that are creating more rental housing and more affordable housing Answer. across the province. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Victim Services of Renfrew County does a tremendous job in assisting and working with victims of crime to help them through their terrible circumstances. But we have a problem here, Minister. Due to legislative changes that have vastly increased their workload by over 700 per cent, coupled with the fact that they've had no meaningful funding increase in the past five years, puts them on the brink of being unable to provide the services so badly needed in Renfrew County and, indeed, all across Ontario. Yeah. Speaker, I've written to the minister about this in the past and have made it clear 
that without an increase in funding, victims of crimes are at a, are at a greater risk than ever before. Will the minister commit to funding victim services to the level necessary to comply with the mandate that he has given them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank question. the member opposite for asking the question. He has, in fact, written to me and he has spoken to me about this very important uh, issue as well, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I want to be very clear that our government is very much committed uh, to helping victims of crime when they need it most. Since 2003, the Ministry of the Attorney General has invested over a billion dollars in vital ser services to support those who have been harmed by crime. As part of our government's strategy to end human trafficking, we will be uh, investing $1.93 million over four years to expand the benefits available under the Victim Quick Response Program to better serve victims of human trafficking. Speaker, we are also investing $6.65 million over four years to enhance the Victim Crisis Assistance Ontario Program so that our community-based service delivery partners can provide better support and case coordination for victims of human trafficking. Further, Speaker, Answer. as part of the government's Sexual Violence and Harassment Action Plan in 2015, we increased funding to sexual assault centres by $1.75 million per year. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Minister. Thank you very much. There's a lot of numbers there, Speaker, but victims of crime are still being left unserviced. The Minister knows that the funding formula that victim services rely on is incoherent at best, inconsistent, and full of boutique envelopes. This part is not complicated. Even though victims is largely volunteer-based, if the funding is not there, they can't provide the services that are needed by the people. Along with the exp exponentially growing caseload, they are now faced with the cost implications of Bill 148, leaving them in an even more threatened financial position. Speaker, can I count on the minister today to ensure that victim services of Renfrew County will receive the funding it requires to provide the services that victims of crime so badly need? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Speaker, we very much recognize the hard work that victim services uh, do in Lanark County and across the, uh, the province, and that's why as we are introducing these very important programs on the urging of a lot of these uh, victim services groups like human trafficking uh, to, uh, to end violence, uh, sexual violence against women, we're making sure that there are funding uh, available to go with it because we recognize that there is going to be extra workload. Speaker, we're also doing work, uh, work right now with indigenous uh, victims. There's work happening on gender-based uh, uh, violence to make sure that there's more appropriate supports available for victims. But Speaker, I also want to highlight though that the, me the members got to be careful uh, because one of the things that he is guaranteeing the people of Lanark and the people of Ontario is a $12 billion cut from essential services. So is he telling that is he going to take away a billion dollars worth of victim services wow. as a result of their people's guarantee? Speaker, I hope that is not the case because that is going to be a major setback for these organizations for the services New they provide. Question. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Acting Premier, paramedics in Waterloo Region are struggling. Because of offloading delays at local hospitals, ambulances are taken off the road as paramedics wait for their patients to be transferred. This year, the Waterloo Region Paramedic Services has seen a rise in both Code Yellows, where there are three or fewer local ambulances on the road, and Code Reds, where there are no local ambulances on the road. None. Mr. Speaker, ambulances are essential to our health care system. Without them, people in crisis lose access to the care that they need. It shouldn't take a person's death, like in Hamilton, for the government to start taking these shortages seriously. What will the government do to ensure that there are no more code reds in Waterloo Region? Thank you, Deputy uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I know that the uh, the three City of Waterloo hospitals are all participating uh, in the dedicated offload nurses program that the ministry uh, initiated and has been implementing for a number of years. And it provides additional resources directly to ERs through nursing support so that they can assist and expedite those offloading challenges that uh, may take place in hospitals around the province. And so, Mr. Speaker, it's uh, important uh, that Ontarians understand, because uh, uh, this is such vital funding, that 100 per cent of that funding to support offloading is provided by the government, is provided uh, through the Ministry of Health. Uh, it's funded through the city. The City of Waterloo receives the funding from us, but it is 100 per cent provided by the government. And I'm happy to talk specifically about the performance of Waterloo 
do uh, in the supplementary. Do supplementary. Thank you very much. Ambulance response times have slightly improved in Waterloo Region, but increasingly these calls are taking longer because of offloading delays at the local hospitals. The average for ambulance days lost to offload delays has increased by 167 per cent compared to October 2016. The Waterloo Region Paramedic Services has asked the government to provide enhanced funding for offload nurses in the region. According to their interim report, provincial funding for the offload nurse program has not kept pace with the increase in patient volumes and, in fact, has marginally decreased. Ontario families deserve more than an underfunded health care system that lurches from crisis to crisis. Will the government commit today to provide Waterloo Region with the funding that they need for the dedicated offload nurses? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, our funding for offload nurses uh, province-wide has increased actually by 64 per cent since 2011 and 12. So in the last five years, Mr. Speaker, a 64 per cent increase. But I think it's important that those who, who rely on the Waterloo hospitals understand that, that those three hospitals in the city of Waterloo have above-average provincial emergency department patient flow and above-average provincial ambulance patient flow, resulting in higher ambulance offload times. In fact, the ambulance offload time ranking uh, of hospitals based on a 90th percentile uh, from highest to lowest, uh, the Grand River Hospital and the Cambridge Memorial Hospital are ranked 12th and 17th respectively out of 123 EDs in Ontario. So I want to congratulate the hospitals in the city of Waterloo because Answer. notwithstanding the argument made by the member opposite, they are performing exceedingly well and we're remunerating them directly to do that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Post-Secondary -Edu post Education and Professional Development. Post-secondary education is, but I also know about the financial barriers that many students face when they try to access post-secondary education. And I know that the minister firmly believes that the decision whether to obtain a post-secondary education should be based on students' ability to learn and not their ability to pay. Post-secondary education is important for it to be affordable for it, uh, students, and it's also important for our economy. Seven out of ten new jobs will require a post-secondary education, so access to high-quality post-secondary education is important to the economy Question. as well as to the students. Can the minister explain what she's doing about this problem? Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I have to say the uh, thank you to the member opposite for her passion about post-secondary education. Speaker, the transformation of OSAP has been a resounding success. We've had 50,000 more students apply this year than same time last year. Over 200,000 students in this province are getting free tuition, Speaker, and another third of our students are getting help with, the, with their tuition and their living costs, Speaker. It is tremendous. And, Speaker, almost all of students who receive OSAP receive grants that they will not have to repay. We are absolutely committed to making sure that every student in this province has the ability to has the ability to learn, Speaker, because our economy depends on it. As the member opposite has said, our future economy depends on a well-educated workforce, Answer. and we're doing a very good job getting there, Speaker. Thank you for the minister. A great legacy that the transformation of OSAP is for our province. So, I had the pleasure this, me this morning of meeting with the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance, and I know that it's not only tuition that, that is difficult for them, there are other costs that they have to face. Tuition is not the only cost of post-secondary education. The very real concern that they brought to me is the price of textbooks. Now, textbooks are certainly an important tool of learning, but their cost is often burdensome for students, and I think it is important that we address these costs fully. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister explain what action the government is taking to increase fairness and opportunity in Ontario? 
because we want to assist students Question. with their non-tuition costs. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I am really delighted to talk to the House about eCampus Ontario, and I urge anyone who's getting a little bored with the proceedings here to go online. eCampus Ontario, Speaker, 227 different textbooks are available, not just to students, Speaker, but to the uh, general public as well. So 227 titles. We are looking at expanding that number, Speaker. We've invested another million dollars so that more textbooks can be added to this library. I, I, um, this means real savings for students, Speaker. These textbooks can cost hundreds of dollars. Uh, so real savings, it's far more convenient to be able to access uh, open educational resources. We applaud USA for uh, pushing us on this issue, Speaker. They've been tremendous advocates. They did it on Answer. free tuition. They're doing it again on free textbooks. Thanks, Speaker. Thank you. The member from Chatham, Ken, has a new question. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, speaker, earlier this morning, we heard the names of several of those who lost their lives on 401's Carnage Alley. And this Question, is directed please. to the uh, Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Uh, now, the Premier made a promise to this House to build a barrier. Everyone understood her to mean a concrete medium barrier. But then the, the, but then the Premier began walking the promise back. The Transport Minister uh, then said that he was looking into high-tension cables. It's not good for small cars and motorcycles decapitation and large trucks would just simply plow right through them now speaker winter is coming that stretch from queen's line to kent road 15 in my riding of chatham kent essex is extremely hazardous transports will inevitably cross over the grass median and end up in the ditch in the opposite direction now road construction is currently taking place there right now speaker my constituents are demanding a concrete barrier not a cable barrier I've organized a town hall meeting in my riding of Chatham County Thursday evening. So my question to the minister is simply this: Will you attend? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Speaker. Of course, I thank the member from Chatham, Kent Essex, uh, not only for the question today. Uh, he and I have had the opportunity to go back and forth on this very precise topic here in this legislature, in this chamber during question period. We've also had the opportunity to speak about this a number of times one-on-one. -on -one. And frankly, Speaker, he was uh, good enough to arrange for some of his constituents to come here to Queen's Park uh, to, uh, to meet with myself and some of our officials to talk about this very issue. Uh, so I do respect the fact the members asked the question today and the fact that he's also organized a town hall meeting for, I believe, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening uh, back in his community. As I mentioned to the member, uh, there will be officials from the Ministry of Transportation who will be attending the town hall tomorrow evening, Speaker. And I've also assured that member and his constituents uh, that I take the issue of highway safety, road and highway safety, extremely seriously, Speaker. It's why we've passed legislation with, this, with respect to this. It's why we're happy to keep the conversation going. And frankly, Speaker, it's also why following the meeting with his constituents, I did ask the ministry to go back and do additional analytical work on Thank the you. request coming forward from that member, from people in his community, and I'd be happy to provide additional. Thank you. Thank you Supplementary. Oh, that was it. Supplementary. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it was it was so quiet. I decided to just keep question period going. <laughs> the, uh, the minister on a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a point of order. Uh, I may have misspoke during my uh, answer to the member of Barry. The portable housing benefit will be increasing to $15 million wow. a year in 2020. Great. Wow. Councillor, your point of order. A record in my response to the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. I mentioned uh, uh, Lanark as his community. I meant to say Renfrew. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a deferred vote on the government notice of motion number 43 relating to allocation of time to Bill 177 and act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bill.
On November the 28th, 2017, Madame Lamont moves uh, government notice of motion number 43 relating to allocation of time on Bill 177, an act to implement budget measures and to enact and amend various statutes. All those in favour of the motion, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Dahmer. Ms. Dahmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. Jass. Ms. Jass. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Song. Mr. Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 48, the nays are 41. The ayes being 48 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 3 p.m. this afternoon.